Billionaire Mike Bloomberg isn't on the ballot in Nevada, but he's competing hard in the major Super Tuesday states, and his unlimited campaign war chest makes him very much a factor in this race. He's also one poll away from qualifying for the debate this week in Las Vegas. Their poll numbers mean more scrutiny of his record. Rivals are attacking his past support of New York's stop and frisk policing tactic, which critics say disproportionately targeted young men of color. Now, here's how he used to defend this policy. It's not a disproportionate percentage of those who witnesses and victims describe as committing the murder. In that case, incidentally, I think we disproportionately stop whites too much and minorities too little. 95% of your murders and murderers and murder victims fit one MO. You can just take the description, Xerox it, and pass it out to all the top. They are male minorities 15 to 25. But now that he's running for president, he says he was wrong. I defended it looking back for too long because I didn't understand then the unintended pain it was causing to young black and brown families and their kids. I should have acted sooner and faster to stop it. I didn't. And for that, I apologized. His alleged past statements about women in the workforce are also coming back to haunt him. A Washington Post story this weekend details his history of making sexist statements and numerous lawsuits and allegations over the years suggesting that his company was a hostile workplace for women, especially pregnant women. The Bloomberg campaign is denying most of what's in the story while admitting that, quote, his words have not always aligned with his values and the way he has led his life. Uh, Margaret, in many ways, hard to believe that you think about Bloomberg and his past uh, with race and gender running for the nomination in a party that takes race and gender very seriously with women and African-Americans being very much a part of that key constituency. I think there are two things to look at, and one is the intense desire inside the Democratic Party to defeat Donald Trump, which is creating different sort of thresholds and, and standards among some voters right. for how they, the lens through which they view candidates. And the other is the amount of time that has passed uh, over the course of, between some of these allegations and now, and what Michael Bloomberg has done in between. And I think you'll see his campaign argue about his philanthropic investments, about... Um, these being things that he's begun to apologize for and will continue talking about, I still think they're really serious allegations uh, that we've only really begun to see the beginning of the airing of. There are going to be massive oppo dumps. Presumably, uh, he and his team know this. <laughs> but I just I think this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, the sort of public vetting of this and understanding how it's going to affect Democratic votes. And I just don't think we know yet really what the impacts. And, and Tarini, in the meantime, you've had prominent African-Americans, people like um, Muriel Bowser, who's the mayor of D.C., Steve Benjamin, the mayor of Columbia, uh, South Carolina, endorse him, as well as Gregory Meeks, who, who's out of New York and a member of the CBC. You know, one of the things that are really important to the African-American community is closing that wage gap. And he has a plan on closing the wage gap. There are some substantial things that Michael Bloomberg has done that he can speak about in a positive way in regards to the African-American community. And he definitely has some great plans that he can do and will do as president of the United States. And, Tarina, you were with Bloomberg covering his uh, event in North Carolina. You talked to some African-American voters there. What did they say about Bloomberg? They kind of brought up a similar argument. What they've said is that they've accepted Bloomberg's apology. They're willing to move on. And they also compared what he said to what Trump has said over the years. They've been dealing with that in states like North Carolina and Tennessee, uh, where they know a lot of Trump supporters, and they told me they hear a lot of, uh, you know, potentially racist comments from some of those supporters that they're around. And uh, they said that what Bloomberg said was mild compared to what they've heard from some of those supporters. That's the argument they made. They also think that Bloomberg is the candidate that, uh, that could beat Trump. That is something that comes up over and over again. And what we're already seeing is Bloomberg is kind of starting to talk about stop and frisk a little bit more than he, than he did a few weeks ago. As this becomes more of an issue, we saw last night in Virginia, Virginia, for example, he included his apology on stop and frisk in his stump speech. This is something he has not been doing. He only usually answers for it when someone brings it up and questions him about it. And, and what we've seen is Bloomberg flooding the airwaves uh, with ads. You look at his campaign spending $386 uh, million. Tom Steyer, another billionaire in the race, $187 million. So the image that 
a lot of voters are seeing in their living rooms over and over again on all manner of channels about Bloomberg is very different from some of the articles that are coming up about his past, whether it's stop and frisk. Uh, can this money end up buying him delegates in these Super Tuesday races? Well, that's the essential question of this entire race is can how much does will this money sway voters? What we know, you know, historically is that Spending this kind of money can narrow a gap between an opponent. It can maybe get you a couple of points on, in ads. It can't really get you up in the polls. But already we've seen Bloomberg has really risen up in the polls, and we've just never seen this much money spent before. Right. So this is all a wild experiment with our yeah, political system. Indeed. We don't know how it's going to work out. But I do think, you know, the questions about his background, I really wonder how much those will matter with voters. Right. Voters are, as both these very smart ladies pointed out, <laughs> voters are very focused on electability. So unless his opponents can turn those arguments, the questions about stop and frisk, the questions about his treatment of women into something that makes him, that is a problem in terms of his ability to beat Trump, I really wonder if they stick. And the voters he is doing well at, uh, well with, moderate and, and conservative, and we'll put this up, um, it's coming at Joe Biden's expense. If you look at Joe Biden overall, he's down nine, Michael Bloomberg up eight. Modern conservative uh, voters, Joe Biden, a strong point of his, but he's down 11, Bloomberg's up uh, 12. Black voters, Biden is down 22 points. There's a pretty big margin of error uh, with that, but it's still, you see Michael Bloomberg gaining and then 65 and over as well. Those are Biden's uh, voters. He's losing. Uh, Bloomberg is gaining. If you're Biden, you're nervous. You have to be. And look, if you're Bloomberg, this was the theory of the case of your entire campaign. And frankly, this was the theory of the case of just about every other Democratic campaign that was out there, which was Joe Biden's numbers were soft. And if you started to puncture them a little bit in one of the early states, they would start to drop precipitously. I think the the big concern for the Biden campaign obviously has to be the African-American numbers. That's obviously the firewall. That's South Carolina. I think that's one poll, and I think we're waiting to see in terms of what's going to happen going forward. But it underscores the fact that people are looking at Joe Biden right now, whether rightly or wrongly, and I think based on the first two races, it appears to be rightly, that the, the weakness is real. And whether or not he's going to last beyond the next two or three weeks seems to be an open question amongst a lot of Democrats and Democratic campaigns. And that goes back to the electability argument. Okay, if there's no Biden, who is it? Right? And if Klobuchar doesn't have the money or the organization, or if Pete Buttigieg is too young or inexperienced, then who is it? And that's when Mike Bloomberg and Mike Bloomberg's bonkers amount of money that he's spending yeah, around right. the country suddenly becomes a real option. I don't know if that sustains, but I think in this moment of kind of mini panic from at least the establishment side or, or kind of the, the moderate, moderate Democratic yeah. lane, that's where they're ending up. Right. And Nancy Pelosi saying uh, it's not quite time to panic yet when it comes to Joe Biden. We come down to the winning, winnowing process. But I see everything as an opportunity. And I see, uh, and I, quite frankly, with all the respect in the world for Iowa and New Hampshire, I'm not counting Joe Biden out. There's still races ahead that are much more representative uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the country. She brought Biden up on her own, hasn't endorsed, but that's what she had to say. Yeah, I mean, she's made the argument throughout this race that Democrats don't want to move too far to the left. It's the same argument that we've seen former President Barack Obama make. Um, and of course, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, the rest of the Democratic establishment are not going to come out and say, please panic, Democrats. Right? Right. <laughs> but I think randomly bringing up Joe Biden yeah. interview yeah. in Munich is a little bit of a sign that they're so right. panicking. Yeah.